Hurricane Sally came ashore in the early hours of Wednesday morning, slamming into Alabama's coastline. Florida's panhandle also bore the brunt of 165 km per hour winds, as heavy rain and storm surges led to life-threatening floods. Many residents were forced to evacuate to hotels as conditions worsened. I mean, there's, there's got to be people that were left in their, in their offices, you know, things like that at this point. Hopefully everybody got out okay, but um, I just, I, I feel for the people that are not, do not have as much storage as we have here. Sally has now weakened after making landfall, but continues to move at an agonizingly slow pace. Forecasters say that makes this storm extremely dangerous for much of the Gulf Coast. Daylight in Alabama showed a scene of devastation with severe flooding and damaged homes. Logan still was at home in Gulf Shores, where Sally made landfall. We just rode it out, got on the first floor. We started hearing all of our windows start to pop. Uh, part of the roof started coming off and siding was ripping. We just rode it out. Last month, Louisiana was hit by one of the most powerful storms on record. Hurricane Laura killed at least eight people and cost the state billions. And the hurricane season isn't over until the end of November. With force and fury. Wow, this hurricane is no joke. Hurricane Sally made landfall along the coast of Alabama just after 6 a.m., bringing some of the Gulf of Mexico with it. No idea where that boat came from. The storm hit the coast as a Category 2 hurricane, packing sustained winds of more than 165 kilometers an hour. My wife was just crying because she never seen this before too, and my kids were scared, and I told them it was going to be okay. The storm knocked out power lines, leaving more than half a million people in Alabama and Florida in the dark. The wind was powerful enough to tip over this tractor trailer. Luckily, the driver wasn't seriously hurt. In Gulf Shores, Alabama, roadways became waterways. Buildings in low-lying areas were flooded, while some high-rises had walls ripped away. In Pensacola, Florida, part of this bridge is now gone. Where it wasn't wind, it was rain. In some areas, the storm was expected to drop anywhere from 60 to 90 centimeters of rain. I will tell you it's bad. Uh, it's going to take a considerable amount of time to clean up from this. In one neighborhood, the flood water brought an unwanted visitor. Oh my God, this is outside of our window. It is a 10 or 12 foot alligator. The high water conditions also made it difficult for emergency crews to help those who tried to ride out the storm because of the high winds, because of the amount of flooding that we're seeing, um, where our responders right now are having to stage because it's so dangerous. This is the damage leaders at the El Bethel Primitive Baptist Church in Mobile are still trying to wrap their heads around. Sally ripped the church's steeple right off the building. Yesterday, members of the church showed up to help Pastor Jonathan Yates and his family begin the cleanup process. We had preached messages prior to this storm by the Lord will provide are a stormy people in a stormy world. He was preparing us for this. About 50 miles south, the damage is even worse. Fort Morgan, Alabama, near where Sally made landfall, is now a disaster zone. There, the storm ripped entire floors off homes and left boats piled on top of each other in the rubble of a collapsed dry dock. From the air, we got a look at the path of destruction Sally left behind. A pier in Gulf Shores, Alabama was ripped in half after a $2.4 million renovation. A ribbon-cutting ceremony was scheduled for the day Sally made landfall. We also saw chunks missing from the Pensacola Bay Bridge, which was in the middle of a $400 million makeover. So far, the city of Pensacola says Sally caused more than $12 million in damage. Back in Mobile, Pastor Yates estimates it will cost about $300,000 to fix that steeple and the roof. He says he's just happy the damage wasn't any worse. We were emotional, very emotional at first. Really? But then we were thankful that uh, there was no life lost. That's just the building. Yeah, that's just the building. The rain in Florida today measured in feet, not inches, swamping homes and trapping people in high water as it crept inland. Joining me now is Kristen Cola in Penascola, Florida, so where the rain has caused extreme flooding. So, Kristen, I understand you're in your home and it's flooding around you as we speak. Can you tell us just what's going on around you? Uh, yes, I can tell you things are finally, we've calmed down a little bit. Um, it got bad really, really fast. Um, at about 6 o'clock this morning, we woke up to 
basically hearing our furniture on the first floor bobbing around and moving water. Um, by the time we realized what had happened, our first floor was completely flooded. Our doors were completely removed. Um, walls were busted in. Um, we had um, living room furniture, ping pong table, kind of that first floor was our game room and um, all that stuff is gone now. Um, once that room flooded, it goes into the garage and the garage flooded. Um, it moved everything from full blown refrigerators to wooden beams off the wall. Um, so in our house, we got very lucky. We're basically in a four story home. And the Pantanal, the world's largest wetland and not a drop of water in sight. Fires have been blazing here since July, leaving a trail of destruction. So far, there have been more than 15,000 fires, triple the number than the same period last year. It's the worst record since 1998, when the government National Institute for Spatial Research started measuring them. It's a, it's a really sad combination of, of, uh, of, of drought uh, with, with bad policy from our government, uh, uh, lack of control uh, and wrong discourse on the media all the time, uh, kind of incentivizing uh, illegal practices towards the environment because they think it's good for agriculture, for mining and activities like that, which is a huge mistake. Uh, with all the fire that we're getting in, in the Pantanal and also in the Amazon, it does have an effect on water cycles that irrigates our agriculture in, in Cerrado and southwards. Flames have already incinerated animal sanctuaries and also farms like this one. Within minutes, we saw it all come to an end, including the animals. It's very sad because we couldn't do anything. And out of those devastating wildfires, burning nearly 5 million acres along the west already this year. And the fires are making it increasingly difficult to breathe with that thick, toxic smoke. Portland, Oregon, with the worst air quality in the world. Kaylee Hartung has the latest. Hey, time to move the hose line up. This dramatic new video recorded on a firefighter's helmet, capturing just how fast the Creek Fire overwhelmed crews in California earlier this month. Enormous flames engulfing homes on both sides, cars melting in the street as whipping winds fuel thick clouds of smoke and plague visibility as firefighters maneuver through fiery streets. Overnight, those walls of fire still moving. A ring doorbell camera capturing the moment the fire rages through the Sequoia National Forest and closes in on this home. In Oregon, toxic air blankets the state. You can see the destruction this wildfire left behind here, but look around me. The smoke hanging so thick, this is the most polluted air in the world. State authorities say about one in 10 visits to the emergency room right now are related to this air quality. Did those numbers line up with what you're seeing here? Absolutely. We've definitely seen an increase in respiratory illness, particularly in people predisposed to it. And we have more breaking news. The Bobcat fire has now moved further into the Antelope Valley. It's now threatening the community of Pear Blossom. And that is where we find eyewitness news reporter Jade Hernandez live with the very latest. And you've been out there all morning, Jade. Good morning to you. Good morning, Rachel and John. We were in Pear Blossom. We've moved to Juniper Hills. We, we definitely got some reports of homes burning. And behind me, this is about a mile away, you can see thick black smoke. Containment is up this morning, but the acreage the Bobcat fire has burned is also up. We also have new evacuation orders to tell you about this morning. Now, wind gusts pushed this fire west and north. The explosion of flames meant that the Bobcat fire now sits at more than 17,000 acres burned. And because of that, the U.S. Forest Service says more neighbors were asked to evacuate or warned they may have to evacuate soon. The Sheriff's Department couldn't say exactly how many homes were affected, but did say June Upper Hills north to Longview was threatened. And as I mentioned, fire containment is up. That's at 15%. But the Bobcat fire threatens southern parts of the Antelope Valley, Mount Wilson and its observatory, and the northern part of the San Gabriel Valley. Flames, which jumped 106th Street, consumed several homes in that area. So far, no reports of any injuries. We were able to speak to some Juniper Hills neighbors escaping all of this before it was too late. 
-hmm. I wasn't worried until the winds picked up. Once the winds picked up, then it just, it exploded. It could be 50-50 whether it's there or not, but I saw a big, big push of flame going through there, so I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna hope, hopeful I can go back up tonight and, and, and take a look. I want to correct something I said earlier. I said 17,000 has been a long morning already. It's 72,000 and that we were out here live yesterday and it was at 55,000 more than 55,000 acres burned. So right now the Bobcat fire sits at more than 72,000 acres burned and I want to show you this fast check was already across Juniper Hills Road. We're at Linda Mesa Road and Juniper Hills Road. This fast check was already out here yesterday morning. A lot of these homes you can see the area now that it's light you can actually see where fire crept up really close and burned some parts of this area. We're going to continue to monitor this. Greek sheep farmers waded through the murky, chest-high waters of what looked like a lake on Saturday. But it was in fact a submerged village just outside Karditsa, left battered by Storm Ionos. At least two people have died after the Medicaid or Mediterranean hurricane pounded central Greece, leaving streets and homes virtually unrecognisable. The storm uprooted trees and caused power cuts on the Ionian Islands and the western Peloponnese on Friday, before moving further inland, hitting the cities of Karditsa, Farsala and their surrounding areas the hardest. The body of an elderly woman was discovered in a flooded house near Farsala, according to fire brigade officials. Authorities were still searching for two more people who had been reported missing. Later, authorities said a 63-year-old man was found dead near a hospital in Karditsa. It was not immediately clear whether he was one of the two reported missing. Of residents in the LA area were woken up last night by a 4.5 magnitude earthquake. It struck less than two miles west southwest of South El Monte at 11:38 p.m. KCAL 9's Joy Benedict is live in South El Monte this morning with the latest. Hey, Joy. Hey, I, I think I've recovered. I don't know about you, but we've been talking about did you feel it? I know you said you didn't. It woke me up out of bed last night at 11:38. I felt the jolt. I checked my phone to see how big it was, and I was like, ah. Oh, I'm going back to bed and I was able to, but for a lot of people, it certainly was a little bit more of a reminder that we need to do something. But here in um, South El Monte, the good news is there's no damage reported. I mean, look inside this store. They were closed at midnight, but you can see all the bottles still remain on the shelves as nothing even fell off. And this is very close to where this earthquake took place. So that is good news, but that is not the case for everyone. Of course, many were a little more startled to say the least. <laughs> This is security video from Kelly's Corner Tavern in Placentia, quite a few miles away, and you can see they definitely felt it, and we can hear them feeling it. Of course, many of them got up and walked around and ran off, not sure what to do. That's not the right thing to do. When you do feel that shaking, if you're not laying on a bed or sitting on a couch, you want to stay there, and you should stay there or stop, drop, and cover and hold on. Stop, drop, and hold on is what they want you to do. But this wasn't the only place that felt it. Take a look at this video in Long Beach. You can really see the security cameras sort of starting to sway here from this person's home. This was taken from a ring camera out there. Now, Caltech says you are probably, this quake is along the same lines as the Puente Hills Thrust Fault System. That's the same one that ruptured back in 1987, Whittier Narrows earthquake, in almost the exact same place. But clearly, that one was much stronger, hitting a magnitude of 5.9. They were originally saying this one was a 4.6, but then settled on a 4.5 magnitude quake that we had last night at 11:38. But nonetheless, talking to folks who've been out and about, they definitely felt it. It shook it pretty hard. Yeah. Shook the whole couch and everything. It was powerful. It, it moved my whole body, and, and as soon as my first reaction was to get up and leave. Now, as I mentioned, the good news is no damage reported, no injuries reported. The city of Los Angeles did go into earthquake mode. Though what that means is firefighters from 160, 106 different neighborhoods went out and about, checked the buildings, checked the structures, make sure they didn't see any signs of obvious damage. That took about an hour for them to complete that. But again, nothing reported, and that is the best news of all. But definitely a uh, jolting reminder that we are in earthquake country, Leslie, and we need to take those precautions and a reminder of 
of just what we need to do, which is stop, drop, and simply hold on when we feel the earth start moving. Don't get up and try and run around. Just stay still and hold on until the shaking stops. In full view of Thailand's official royal residence, tens of thousands of protesters gathered Saturday to demand reforms to the country's government and the monarchy itself. It's a bold position to take in a country where criticizing the royal family can result in a 15-year prison term. Protesters are calling for an end to those restrictions. They also want to reduce the king's constitutional powers, along with his control of the estimated $40 billion royal fortune. Earlier in the day, the student-led movement had occupied the grounds of nearby Thammasat University, where they demanded new elections, a new constitution, and the resignation of Prime Minister Prayut Chan-ocha. The former army commander came to power in a 2014 coup d'etat, the latest in a dozen such coups by the monarchist military since the end of absolute royal power in 1932. Protesters say they plan to rally overnight before marching to the prime minister's offices on Sunday, a plan the government has warned them not to carry out. The Thai monarchy has yet to address the protests. Since taking the throne in 2016, King Mahavajiralongkorn has spent most of his time in Germany. A trailblazing advocate for gender equality and a cultural icon. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whose long and pioneering legal career was driven by her own struggles as a woman in a male-dominated profession. At Harvard Law School, she was one of just nine women in a class of 500. After graduating from Columbia top of her class, she still had a hard time finding a job because federal judges didn't want to hire women. In 1972, Ginsburg co-founded the Women's Rights Project at the American Civil Liberties Union. By 1974, the body had participated in over 300 gender discrimination lawsuits. Ginsburg gained a reputation for her slow and steady approach, favoring winnable battles over flashy cases, as she gradually laid the legal foundations for gender equality. In 1993, she was nominated to the Supreme Court by Bill Clinton, making her only the second woman to serve on America's top judicial body. There, she continued to defend women's rights with rulings on controversial issues like abortion and was renowned for being a great dissenter. When people would ask her how many of the court's nine seats should be held by women, she always gave the same reply. When do you think there will be enough? And I said, obvious, when there are nine. <laughs> her small stature combined with her refusal to be intimidated saw her rise to the status of pop culture icon, earning her the nickname Notorious RBG. Donald Trump's nomination of two Supreme Court justices left Ginsburg one of four progressives crucial to maintaining the balance on the conservative-leaning court. She survived several bouts of cancer and a heart operation and was hospitalized multiple times in recent years. Ginsburg always said she would carry on with her job as long as her health allowed. Well aware that her death or retirement under a conservative president could see the court take a definitive swing to the right shifting U.S. policy for decades to come and jeopardizing her own progressive Thank legacy. Now, Ginsburg was a champion for women's rights and a hero for those on the left. Our Washington correspondent, Ketavan Gorgistani, joins us now outside the Supreme Court. First of all, Ketavan, what is the atmosphere like there right now? 
Well, uh, just like uh, last night, there are hundreds of people who have gathered here in front of the Supreme Court. The only change is that the police uh, put out barriers uh, to keep people away from the steps of the Supreme Court. But people have been uh, gathering here for uh, hours. Uh, there are plenty of uh, uh, flowers on the ground and uh, people uh, writing in chalk on the sidewalk messages uh, for uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and also some of her uh, most uh, famous uh, quotes. Uh, one, uh, for example, uh, when uh, she was asked, uh, when will there be enough women in the Supreme Court? And she said, when there are nine and there are a lot of thank yous written on the grounds of the Supreme Court. Thank you uh, for teaching us how to fight Red One, uh, finishing by saying uh, that we will continue. And that's one of the messages uh, of uh, some of the people here. There's, of course, a lot of sadness, but uh, they feel that they have a duty uh, to continue the fight that Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, held uh, her whole life. And uh, they also are very worried about uh, what comes next. But right now, people are remembering her legacy. Uh, the words that keep coming back are icon, role model, trailblazer, and of course, champion for women's rights, for gender equality. That was the fight of her life. And people here uh, really uh, remember it. And uh, there was uh, this uh, really uh, cute moment uh, here. There were two uh, little uh, kids uh, who sat on the ground uh, next to uh, riding uh, in chalk. And uh, they really uh, showed uh, this uh, next uh, generation, uh, really showing that they will continue the fight, that they've learned from her and that they uh, will take it upon themselves to continue that fight for the coming generations. Well, there's already a fight in Congress over who will succeed Ginsburg and when. How is that fight playing out between Democrats and Republicans? Yesterday, someone uh, told me it's about to get very ugly, and it has indeed uh, gotten uh, pretty uh, ugly already. The battle is uh, going to be fierce. Uh, yesterday, just a few hours after uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's uh, passing was announced, there was a statement from the Senate Majority uh, Leader uh, Mitch McConnell, a statement in which, in the same statement, he mourned the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, but also finished by saying that Donald Trump's nominee would get a vote on the Senate floor. And, of course, the president has announced that he wants to push forward very quickly with finding a nominee and going through the process of appointing uh, that a person in the Senate, uh, controlled by the Republican, is adamant that they uh, will uh, do that, that they will go ahead uh, with the process. There's a battle, of course, because remember that back in 2016, the Republicans blocked Barack Obama from uh, filling the vacant seat left after the death of uh, ju the conservative uh, Justice Antonin Scalia. And uh, some of those quotes back then from the Republicans are being brought back uh, to light, especially the one by Lindsey Graham, who said, you can use my words against me. Uh, there should not uh, be a a, a vacant a seat filled during a presidential year. And of course, the Democrats have been pouncing on that. Lindsey Graham uh, walking back a little bit those comments, saying that the situation is not the same today. Back then, a president was Democrat. The Senate was controlled by the Republicans. Uh, this time around, he says the president and the Senate see eye to eye. They're both Republican, and therefore, it's a different uh, story. But the Democrats are going to fight as much as they can. And the key will be uh, lying in to a few senators' hands because uh, already uh, one, at least, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska has uh, said, even before the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, just a few days ago, uh, she said that she would not vote to fill a vacant seat before uh, the election of a new uh, president. The Democrats are hoping that several other Republicans will uh, be uh, joining her to try uh, to uh, block uh, that and to wait until there is an actual president voted for by the people, by the American people, and that the American people get to decide. And only then uh, will uh, there be a replacement for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who had this statement uh, to her granddaughter as she uh, felt that those were her last days. She said that her wish was uh, that uh, her replacement would only be named once there was a new president elected. Okay, Kedavan Gorgistani reporting for us outside the Supreme Court. Thank you so much. Early on in the pandemic, Spain was hit just about as hard as anywhere in Europe. Now in the capital, Madrid, the health system's under renewed pressure. With COVID-19 cases rising, one in five hospital beds in the region is now taken up by someone with coronavirus. 
We are saturated with people who need health care and patients that need care. We are doing the best we can, but we need more health workers. We need more resources. Spain's one of many European nations now bringing in localised lockdowns, worried about a second wave of COVID over winter months. For this bus driver bringing his son in for a test, it's the right approach. I understand that we need to save the economy and move forward, but health is the most important thing. Without health, we don't have money. In the Czech Republic, there were more than 3,000 new cases on Thursday. Adjusted for population, only Spain and France within the European Union have seen a bigger jump in the last two weeks. Now bars are having their opening hours reduced, and in Prague, people will have to wear a face covering at outdoor events with more than 100 attending. In the UK, COVID cases have doubled in a week, and health officials are worried about rises in infections and hospital admissions among all ages. Next week, people in more regions will be told not to mix with other households, just like nearly two million in the northeast of England have. I think it's a farce, because on one hand, you've got people who can go on holidays, you've got people who can go into gyms, you've got people who can go into restaurants and pubs up to 10 o'clock at night, but you can't have your own family to your house. I mean, I don't understand it. Where's the sense in it? Where's the logic? If we hadn't, if we hadn't come out of lockdown too early, or people that have been taking more note, we wouldn't be in this position. Now we'd be further down the line. The UK government's considering warnings from its scientific advisers that restrictions may have to be imposed across England next month to drive down transmission. We are now seeing uh, a second wave uh, coming in. We've seen it in in France, we've seen it in Spain, across, across Europe, it's been absolutely, uh, I'm afraid, inevitable that we would see it in this country. In Scotland, the First Minister's calling this the most decisive moment since March. We might now be on at an earlier uh, stage on a similar path to that that has been taken in recent weeks by France. So our task is to make sure, if we can, that we interrupt that and we don't end up where they are now. Here in London, the Mayor Sadiq Khan is warning that the city is about two weeks behind those regions of England already under local lockdown. He's also hit out at problems experienced by Londoners needing a Covid test, citing government incompetence. Across Europe, governments are having to act fast, winter's approaching and with it predictable pressures on public health facilities. But persuading the public to abide by new curbs on their freedom could prove a tough challenge. Nadine Barber, Al Jazeera, London. Jeff Slegomoc is director for the National Centre for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University. He's joining us on Skype from Manchester in Connecticut. Good to have you with us again, Jeff. Um, given the fact that we are at the stage that we are now and we're seeing this spike in uh, numbers around the world, the previous time one gets the impression, particularly from Nadim's uh, report, that it was the lockdowns that really, if didn't put things into a halt, they at least slowed them down. Is a lockdown the only way to get control of this again? Well, it's certainly one of the most effective ways, especially when you're seeing really significant increases and in really sort of out of control spread of the virus. What you're essentially doing is you're uh, denying it the opportunity to jump from one person to another. And so very significantly suppressing that transmission, which then gives you options for relaxing restrictions and kind of getting parts of the economy going again. It's a very caustic tool. It's very traumatic to, to society in the short run. Uh, but when you see the numbers running away like that, it can be a very effective tool and ultimately lead to more options in the long run. If we do bring in more lockdowns around the world, is there not a risk that we are going to be in this situation again, when again those lockdowns, those second lockdowns, are eventually um, started to li be lifted? So there are sort of two sides to that. One is that pandemics often come in waves. So no matter how effective you are in the first wave, it has a way of sort of traveling around and coming back again and again. So I think no matter what, you do have to be ready to, to know what your options are for responding to subsequent waves. But more directly, uh, will it bounce back right away or not? That has a lot to do with what you do after the lockdown. Are people taking personal responsibility to continue to social distance, to continue to wear masks, taking the relaxed restrictions, but those restrictions still in place seriously? to keep uh, that transmission low so you can start to gradually open up more and more, um, although still a ways off from getting back to normal. Are we in a different situation now when we're considering more lockdowns and certainly with regard to the virus as we were when the first lockdowns were introduced? 
Absolutely. I think there are two things, one working for us, one working against us. The first is that we know a lot more about this virus. There's still a lot we don't know, but the modes of transmission, the rates of transmission, even treatment and, and um, what signals to look for in terms of how serious it is, uh, is all uh, a little bit better defined now that it's been going on for a while, which means that maybe total lockdowns might not be as necessary. Maybe there are some key points within the community um, where you, before you have to get to that point of total lockdowns, you can do uh, less severe measures. But the other piece that's going to work against us is really just this ongoing fatigue. Thank you.